Okay, great. So, hello all. We are here with in this very important video, and we have with us Dr. Ashutosh Karg, who's done his MBBS from US MS New Delhi, and who's currently doing his DNB in family medicine from BL Kapoor, Kapoor New Delhi. He's a final year resident, and you know the past three weeks have been a toll for us all. Delhi has seen unprecedented crisis. And you know the people who have worked on the front line are our dear doctors. So on behalf of every single citizen of Delhi and India, we want to really, really thank our doctors and thank you, Dr. Ashutosh, right now, who are our doctor and you worked really, really hard. So how was your you know past three uh, weeks experience? If you want to share with us briefly, Dr. Ashutosh. Um, it has been crazy. I mean, there is no word to describe it. Most importantly. This particular second wave has been so unpredictable in terms of the severity that it has brought us to us. So it's not that as if the second wave was not predicted, but the way it has come was beyond our belief. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. We can imagine, you know, a lot of doctors, you know, uh, we look as doctors, you know, no matter how much they depersonalize themselves, doctors at the end uh, are humans and, you know, they also feel the same emotions as yeah. all of us. Uh, face and you know seeing uh, deaths in their wards, seeing people crying, seeing people in trouble. You know it takes a lot of toll. But we really, really thank you for you know keeping your spirit alive. So and uh, today is a special uh, you know like video where we are going to talk about some important questions on COVID, important questions that people really need answers to. So if we could just talk you know talk something pre-COVID, like you know if the government has to prepare. What would you, as a doctor, you know, suggest to the government for augmenting the response to a mass casualty incident like this COVID second COVID second wave? It's just like an earthquake. It's just like a mass casualty incident, but a different kind of an earthquake. So, so what do you think the government should do, sir? At this point of time, we already have an example: the Pulse Polio campaign. Uh, the campaign is built on the premise that the government will go to your house to vaccin vaccinate you set up uh, vaccination centers near your households. They take up hospitals, clinic, nursing homes, which are residing within a kilometer of almost every household and deliver vac vaccine. In contrast, we have a drive in which people are supposed to go to vaccination centers which are far away. So that is one problem with the current vaccination drive. The only thing that can possibly save us right now is vaccination. vaccination. And that vaccination has to happen door to door. Okay. And what about all the stress that we have on prevention? So can prevention really be the, uh, you know, the, the, the holy grail or it has to be vaccination uh, as the main uh, focus of prevention? Prevention is something that is working at individual level. So if we are answering question at the government level, then the government as such has little to do in that area. It is more of an individual perspective to maintain social distance, to use masks. So as far as government is concerned, the preventive aspect lies with its citizens more. Okay, okay, great, sir. You know, a lot of questions, a lot of people have a lot of questions, you know, regarding, you know, what we can do, you know, what we can do at our level. So, you know, like, for example, a small doctor, you know, what should a small doctor's clinic, you know, do in order to tackle COVID surge, you know, as seen as the second wave. So what can a small doctor do uh, in, a, in a small clinic in a neighborhood level? You know, something like a Mohalla clinic doctor, something like our neighborhood doctor. What can a doctor in his clinic do? Uh, broadly speaking, such a doctor would be treating mild cases. So we are talking about a person who's not dealing with moderate cases or severe cases, in simple words, not requiring hospitalization. Such a doctor needs to focus on only two things, prevention and treatment of mild cases. Prevention remains the same. Doctors get patients by word of mouth which means that they rely that patients rely on what they say everything that they say so reiterating that wear masks and more importantly how to wear masks most people some people have access to n95 masks but most people can't get it they are costly they are scarce and most importantly they also create this suffocating condition so people tend to use cloth masks or surgical masks now in my practice i have seen People do wear masks, a number of them do, at least in tier one cities, but they don't wear it properly. They don't clip it above their nose. Secondly, uh, for some people, it may not be possible. For example, people who have beards to wear those kind of masks. So for them, 
at least two to three layers need to be worn and tightly enclosed. The area above your nose is the area where you are letting the virus come in. So wearing a mask that partially covers the nose is as good as not wearing a mask. Understood. The only thing that can save you is that mask and not touching your face frequently. If that is one, if there's just one mass message I need to get across. Great. So, so thank you about the message. You know, we'll all take absolute note of wearing masks all the time, especially when we are outside our house. And, you know, some cases in our house when we have other patients or when we have, you know, when we are infected and we want to save other people. Now, one question regarding that small doctor that I want to still answer, you know, as a uh, supplementary to that question is, can that doctor decide, you know, a doctor who's MBBS, who's at this local level, whether a case is a mild case or a moderate case? Um, I'm not sure whether an MBBS doctor can decide because not many people have had that kind of training. But uh, the guidelines to decide whether the case is mild, moderate or severe has remained the same so far, which means you have to see two things, the SpO2, that is the saturation of oxygen in your blood yes, and the respiratory rate. Absolutely. If your saturation is above 94% and your respiratory rate is less than 24, that means in most likelihood you are a mild case. Okay. Understood. And as you go ahead, that means your saturation drops below 94%. And your breathing rate is going above 24. You're going towards a severe case. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, like, uh, as we talk about, you know, individual level, as we talk about, you know, small clinic level, as we talk about uh, what we're seeing around. Recently, there was an absolute, you know, when there was a surge, everybody was behind oxygen cylinders. And, you know, among when the oxygen cylinders were in short supply, people started to buy oxygen concentrators. So, you know... What is this oxygen concentrator? You know, we all know it takes out the oxygen from the surrounding air and it concentrates and the patient can take the oxygen. But there's a lot of talk about the, you know, the uh, flow rate of an oxygen concentrator. A lot of oxygen concentrators of 7 liters per minute, 5 liter per minute are available. Should these oxygen meters of 7 liters per minute and below be bought by individuals, small clinics and hospitals? Uh they should be brought by only those uh, clinics who can hospitalize patients, number one, who have access to other medications that are required for the patient, who have access to shift patients to an intensive care or at least have a referral, uh, referral system. If we are not able to handle this patient, we will be able to shift this patient to another center. If you don't have those capabilities, then it's almost like treating patients without any medical personnel supervising it. So as long as there is some medical supervision with a professional uh, involved in it, it's fine. Individuals should not hold it, should not keep it. Uh, but doctor, I would like to ask about this flow rate, uh, you know, confusion that a okay, lot of okay. people have. But, so, so whether a 7 liter one should be bought or a 10 liter one should be bought, what is this holy grail behind? You know, what's that right number, uh, critical number? There is no right number per se. If you take the statistics into picture, out of 100 people, 80 people will develop infection in the mild category or will be asymptomatic. Around 14% will fall in the moderate category and the rest will fall in the severe category. When it comes to the severe category, these concentrators will be of no use oh. because usually these patients will require way above 7 liter per minute. Okay. All right. They will require more than 10 liter per minute or maybe even more than 30, 40 liter per minute and no 30, concentrator provides that. Okay. No concentrator provides that. Okay. So we are left with this 14% of people who will who may require it. Right. All right. And in these patients also, once they get admitted, usually the requirement is Sorry. quite high. Yes. So without having access to some kind of oxygen supply, which is higher than 10, much higher than 10, just relying on these concentrators wouldn't be wise. So these concentrators, which are of a lower concentration, should be only used by mild patients if the doctor suggests. Is that right? Absolutely. A moderate patient. So moderate mild, patient. Moderate. moderate. Mild is defined by the fact that you don't need oxygen. That you don't need oxygen. Okay. So for moderate patients, if the doctor suggests, you should ask the doctor and then if you suggest 7 liters or yeah. 5 liters. And then, then, yeah. Yeah. And then it has to be titrated uh, on a timely basis. It cannot be just that you give someone this much and it's over. It okay. has to be supervised. Absolutely. So great, great doctor. Now the next question is, you know, there's a lot of talk about the third wave. The government has said that there's going to be a third wave coming. And, you know, they've also said that the children in the third wave are the most vulnerable. 
so you know and because children are not vaccinated and you know we have seen a lot of infections coming up in the second wave among children so you know what can we do to prevent children from getting seriously ill during a third wave which is a possibility as far as children are concerned there is nothing special that you can do okay what you can do for any given adult will impact children as well and the bottom line again is door to door vaccination there is nothing else that can help nothing okay. else so so if i was saying that even for children the government must look at the vaccines that that can be given to children so that even children below 18 can be vaccinated and that has to be done just like the pols polio uh, vaccination even uh, yeah even if you don't end up vaccinating a lot of children even if you vaccinate the current population the current designated population 18 plus so if you have vaccinated enough people we will have less people transmitting it okay 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 so so, so our also focus obvious. should be on vaccination and it should be like on a war front yeah yeah definitely definitely yeah now there's another question you know uh, you know that is like if you get uh, covid you know if you're a patient so apart from you know that spo2 levels the oxygen saturation level which is used uh, taken from a pulse oximeter can there be a reliable alternate monitoring mechanism like you know respiratory rate or manual pulse rate which we can take can these two or um, some other uh, you know mechanism be used as an alternate to the spo2 levels used in the pulse oximeter Okay. See, when it comes to the SpO two level, not even SpO two itself is the holy grail of everything with, that we do with COVID. We do see their pulse rate, we do see their blood pressure, we see their respiratory rate, and we always do that. So it's not as if they are not used. We use as much data as we can to come to a conclusion. Okay. So yes, they are used, but none of them so far has been uh, been. Uh, used as a single marker. One I would say is respiratory rate. It does help, but then again, there's a problem. If you're anxious, your respiratory rate will increase. Absolutely. So even if you're, even if uh, you don't have the disease, just because you're anxious, anxious, your respiratory rate will increase. If your hand is shaking, your SpO two reading will change. So all these things have to be taken into account. Which an unqualified person, I'm really unfortunate that they, we don't have a mechanism wherein by in. unqualified person can say uh, can decide okay 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 but so 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 when you when you say this uh, i understand that spo2 levels monitoring is important so that means that there should be ample supply of pulse oximeters everybody should be getting them it should be available in the market is there any shortage that you think is there of the pulse oximeter De- definitely there is it took me a week to get uh, a second pulse oximeter because i was relying on just one of them and the way we work in the ward it's very easy to lose one break one so it cost me six times more than what an oximeter costs it's very unfortunate that right now there's so much of black marketing and over inflation of prices in everything including oxygen concentrators pulse meters and everything else so i know i'll go to the next question you know uh, is it right to panic and start administering oxygen to someone who's spo2 level or oxygen concentration Tips to eighty five, or you know, we should you know, as WhatsApp forwards come, we should just try proning, or we should just try a breathing exercise. What should we do? Should we really believe these forwards, which you know suggest proning exercises, or we should directly rush to the hospital and start the oxygen? See, uh, bottom line is get in touch with the doctor. That's okay. the bottom line answer to this question, because this is a complicated. There's a complicated way of addressing this question, and if I give it in this. particular scenario it won't be useful so but if i were to give a give some tips proning is beneficial yes it is beneficial it is beneficial for patients who have an spo2 of less than 92% number 1 number 2 you are asking a person to lie on their stomach if that patient is obese if that patient is really ill if that patient is really old and you are somewhere in your house in the in another room it is possible that this patient may not be able to shout for help if something goes wrong okay if you are going into the room the patient is lying listless you may not know if the patient is dead or okay okay Understood. so those are the things that have to, that have to be taken into consideration the, the person should be alert the person should be able to turn himself to the normal position on his or on own the saturation should be seen to be improving with that position 
if these three conditions are fulfilling then yes we can go with pruning but again supervision by some medical professional so without you, that please don't so when you say supervision is important you know when we saw three weeks back people were rushing to hospitals and there was no space in hospitals and supervision as a thing was not possible so in those cases you know it. people were suggesting that you know that's why oxygen lungers started people started giving oxygen on the road and everything which was an alternate mechanism to a hospital which was which tried to be created outside of a hospital so does that mean that we need to have augment the beds and the supervision and the staff at some level or we should actually rely on the makeshift measures that we created in this particular scenario teleconsultation would be of great help okay for patients who can be managed at home because like like i said the question that you posed about spo2 pulse rate and respiratory rate it is all about data the more data i have about you the easier it is for make to me make uh, to make a conclusion that this is what you can do so if i have teleconsultation service and you i can talk to you then it increases my chance to give you the best advice absolutely 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 with that you know we'll go to the next question so in the absence so it's very related in the absence of oxygen can an ambu bag be used by in the transient period by unqualified attendants you know there was a lot of conversation about ambu bag in the initial first you know wave people actually developed makeshift ventilators out of ambu bags they made a small little mechanism where ambu bags were you know uh, you know used and they were making some ventilators so how much is the reliability of an ambu bag and can it be used by unqualified attendants okay let's just review what an ambu bag is ambu stands for artificial manual breathing unit unit because it has lots of parts in it breathing because it is substituting for your breathing process artificial because it is being done from the outside and manual because someone needs to squeeze the balloon in normal circumstances you need several muscles in your body to push in push in air and push it out fine so basically they are also acting as pumps right for any reason if your own muscles aren't working if your brain is not letting them work because of some dysfunction or there is some dysfunction in elsewhere in your body that is not letting your brain work so if this circuit goes haywire you're not able to take in air and push it outside that is when the use of ambu bag comes in okay. versus oxygen oxygen meaning you are able to breathe but you're not getting enough oxygen into your cells which needed for their function because of pneumonia or because of whatever reason yeah 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 the wall that is separating the balloon in your lungs and the blood in the blood that is running that wall has become dysfunctional for some reason water has got filled or whatever reason and the oxygen is not passing so what you do is you increase the level of oxygen and that is what we do when we give oxygen okay and ambu bag doesn't do that okay it marginally increases that amount so what ambu bag does is it helps you in transporting the patient from their home to a hospital okay so it's only an emergency measure secondly acutely used for minutes and hours and that is used in hospitals all around when you don't have ventilators especially in government hospitals till that time it is fine and since there are no medical personnel doing it the attendants are asked to do it but it is a work of a qualified physician it is a work of a qualified paramedic so no i cannot say that an unqualified person should be asked to do it unless and until they have been trained enough unless and until you don't have resources that is the only situation in which uh, the attendants would be asked to uh, use an ambu bag so it's a, it's no alternative for oxygen it is just a emergency transient option for a ventilator only so that the person can be transported and that's only when yes. his muscles inside are not letting you know the diaphragm and the other muscles are not enabling him to breathe but it is definitely yes. not a, a alternate for oxygen supply to the patient thank you so much for that now no. another question is what are the kinds of patients who require icu care can icu care in any subtle way harm a patient if he doesn't need it so two very different questions uh the answer to the first question is like i said you divide the case into mild moderate and severe we know that the mild do not require admission moderate can be managed in wards and the severe cases are those which have a saturation of less than 90% number one which have a respiratory rate of more than 30 per minute plus now here are the main things people who are old they they have bad reserve people who are obese people who are diabetic 
people who have heart disease people who have liver disease and kidney disease so if you have to count on your tips who are the patients who might end up in icu these are those people who have a saturation of less than 90% respiratory rate of more than 30 per minute are obese diabetic heart disease liver disease kidney disease or are on any immunosuppressive drugs like steroids these are the patients who are very much likely to require an icu okay. but because of shortage a number of these patients are being managed in wards nowadays Understood. Understood. Now, now there's a question, you know, which is, you know, for all mild patients, you know, who have recovered from COVID, including myself. Uh, for people who have recovered from mild infection, what is their path to full recovery? Because I'm sure COVID leaves some form of a, you know, post-COVID complication in most people. So, what is the path of full recovery? Like I said, it seventy to eighty percent of patients are going to be either asymptomatic or mild. Uh, this might sound a little uh, insensitive but from a scientific perspective these are the people who are going to be the candidates for novel treatments in future because these are the patients who did not get disease meaning did not get manifestation of moderate disease or severe disease which means either they developed an immune mechanism that was able to fight the virus or innately they were immune to it so basically these people hold key to novel treatments in future not so new maybe just next year as far as recovery is concerned it's not too bad for these people to have gotten this infection because like i said they are the repositories for novel treatments so it's not as if they are they have any uh, leftover effect that we should be worried about if at all there is we are not aware of it right now understood great 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 now you know there's a final question that i want to ask you and want to leave in a, in a very good note because you have told us a lot of information which a lot of viewers are going to churn and you know understand mm. this one question which is you know like the question of hope if there is one thing that you would love to see happening what would it be as a doctor as a person who has worked in a covid ward for 24 24 hour shifts what is this one thing that you would love to see happening <laughs> too many things i need i guess please so, please take all the time is yours uh i'll come to the most basic things the one thing that i would really want people to do is wear their mask properly that is the one thing that you can really save people with because i i have seen people wear mask it is, it's not as if they don't it is just that they don't wear it properly it's so disheartening to see it. even doctors mind you doctors wearing n95 masks but not clipping it properly if you can just do that you at individual level are so busy as a doctor as a patient as a healthcare worker as a frontline worker you may not be able to take the work of the government but at your level if you can just wear your mask properly if i can see that happening i believe at individual level we have taken a good step okay so so our first step first lesson is that you want to see happening is that everywhere everybody wears their mask properly all the time whenever they are outside and whenever they are in a group of people even within their households anything else doctor you know we want to we request you to put a heart out because this may be reaching a lot of people okay uh, i'll try to give solutions rather than very uh, rhetorical answer in this sense i have seen people holding medications you know medications as simple as paracetamol and azithromycin my request is instead it it is wise to have medications at home actually at this point of time but it is better to have to hold those medications in groups you take five or six families in your area carry medications for 20% of them so if you're if you're 20 people you carry medication only for five of them okay it is wise it will help but you will have saved so many people steroids are not available in hospitals we are using alternatives now oh there are se- several steroids so we are we are forced to use alternatives because people are holding holding it in their homes okay. so if you can just use it in a rationing way we can use it at hospital as well great great doctor Do- doctor is there anything else that you want to you know talk and leave us all the viewers in a very good and a positive note uh everyone is stressed i am stressed and i'm sure even you are everyone is talking to me is stressed 
I guess it's really important to keep your mental health in good shape at this point of time. If you have a time to watch comedy, watch comedy. If you think news is troubling you, just shut shut your computers and especially shut your WhatsApp if your uncles are troubling you with medical news. So if you can just distract yourself once in 24 hours towards something that is totally stupid away from the world, that itself can help you and other people around you so that you don't get into that mental spiral of uh, you know bad feelings so great great so so wearing your mask not holding medicines and having great medical health, uh, you know everything to do to have good mental health is the key so thank you so much dr ashutosh it was great having you and you have enlightened all our viewers with lot of important medical information you know right now in the uh, in the wave of you know whatsapp powered in the wave of you know unclaimed unclassified unverified information uh, information from a doctor like you who spent time you know out of your very busy schedule you know very stressful schedule i must say i really really thank you and i'm sure this is going to help a lot of people thank you so much it was great having you in this video uh, today thank you thank you sir. thank you